disappointed, Parker. Are you beginning to realize how hopeless your pitiful plight is? Welcome back and welcome to Season 2, Episode 14 of Me and My Friend Pete, another Donuts and Dimes production. The podcast where we explore all things the Amazing Spider-Man comic book series. I'm your host, Peter Parker's persnickety pal, Gerald. Welcome back, Parker Posse, and if this is your first time with us, what a time to hop aboard the crazy train. Because this week, we're running through the Amazing Spider-Man number 39. How green was my goblin? And you know when that grinning green gas bag pulls up, the golden liability had better be at the top of his game or risk winding up at the bottom of a freshly packed dirt pile. In this one, we've got more teenage angst than a big mouth binge watch. We've got the frozen feelings of the Foolsville faithful finally defrosting for the prince of Forest Hills, Queens. We've got the beginning of an era in grand fashion as Johnny Romita's pencils roam all over NYC from ESU to the Empire State Building to that always East River. And Spidey unmasked to boot. Again, we've got me. We've got you. We've got no further ado. We've got the amazing Spider-Man number 39. How green was my goblin? Or the golden liability. Rumble, young man, rumble. Let's swing! Me and my best friend Pete. Old adventures, new critiques. He spins webs, I spin yarns. Kinda kooky, be forewarned. Look out, it's me and my friend Pete. The credits. The script on this one was done by Smiling Stan Lee with art for the first time in ASM history by Jazzy Johnny Ramita. Inks were done by Mighty Mickey DeMeo. I think this is the first time an inker is getting some credit, but stunning Steve Ditko may have done all that work himself. Maybe. And lettering by adorable Artie. It's in the name Simek. This is the August 1966 issue, so the Amazing Spider-Man comic book series was celebrating its four-year anniversary. The cover. The cover of this issue is set in a sky rapidly turning from morning to dusk. The top third of the cover's background is a twilight blue. And on top of this, we get the Amazing Spider-Man. In that Spider-Man, the animated series, Goldenrod, Yellow and Red. And that's good. Or at least fitting. Because we've got a scene here that's been seared into my memory from the Spider-Man animated series with a slight twist. On his stone gray goblin glider, the front of it a bat-shaped battering ram, is the green goblin. His arms and legs green and scaly, as usual. His mask and its perpetual grin with its large pointed elfish ears, as usual, as well. He's got his purple gloves on, his pointed purple boots, his purple shorts, and purple tank top. Slung over his right shoulder, he's got his purple bag of tricks, as usual, as usual, as usual. There's a jet of fire shooting out from the back of his glider and a plume of thick white smoke billowing out behind that as he rockets towards stage left of the page. He's staring back and down over his right shoulder at Peter Parker, bound by thick brown rope wrapping his arms and torso. <laughs> That's not bad enough for our friend. Pete's outerwear, his white button-up shirt, his green slacks, those are bad both slacks in tatters, sport. revealing his Spider-Man costume beneath his clothes. But wait, there's more. If that ain't bad enough, Pete's eyes are shut, and I'm not even sure the King of Swing is conscious. Beneath the captor and Capti, I think it's Cap Shut it, you! We have a skyline of New York City in gray. Beneath that, in a black caption box, we get... Another Marvel first. Spidey and the Green Goblin. Both unmasked. Let's get into it. Page one opens to a red banner. Inside, V. Amazing Spider-Man. Beneath this, in a white banner with frayed edges, we get a slime green font title. How green was my goblin? Below this, we have a yellow caption box with black lettering inside. Attention all web spinners. Be prepared for more startling surprise developments than you've ever seen in any single Spidey Spectacular before. We went all out on this one, so buckle your seatbelts, and away we go. I gotta say, it's true, 
Anytime they tell us to buckle our seatbelts, we usually got big league action on the way. And the proof to the statement is right here on the page. In the lower left corner of the page, we have a Daily Bugle magazine, final edition, 10 cents, what a time to be alive, with a photo on the left side of its cover of our hero, Spider-Man, staring to his left as if reading the headline of the paper. And if he is, I'm sure he's glad. It reads, Spider-Man's identity, still a mystery. I hope you're not grinning too wide beneath that mask, however, because the paper was tossed by a one green goblin who was clad in his usual purple and lime green costume, bag of tricks draped over his shoulder, pointed ears, wide eyes, and sinister grin in place. He clearly doesn't care about pollution in any form because he's atop his glider, smoke billowing from behind it as a jet of fire shoots him forward. He's racing towards the Big Apple. The goblin's got one thing on his mind. By now, that web-crawling weasel must have forgotten all about the Green Goblin. Therefore, this is the perfect time for me to strike and to get the revenge that my soul is hungering for. My man is that his soul is hungering. This can't be good for the wall crawler. We turn the page. All during the speedy, hair-raising flight back to his hideout, the mysterious Green Goblin works himself into a veritable frenzy as he recollects his previous battles with Spider-Man. Until... Page two opens to the Green Goblin, his back to us, face cloaked in shadow, pulling his mask off, shouting the whole time that he's waited long enough. Now that everything's in his favor, he's going on the offensive. And I gotta say, Green Goblin's giving off big Wilson from Home Improvement vibes. The guy who always had more than half his face covered, so we never truly knew what he looked like. I'm guessing Wilson learned that trick from the Green Goblin, because anytime we've seen the Goblin without his mask so far, he's been perfectly positioned behind a door, or cloaked in shadow, or has his back facing us with a hat on so we don't get so much as a strand of hair for details into who he is. And he's continuing this knack for covering his face, for hiding his face, right now. His mask sitting in the foreground, stage right in the next panel. His upper body is hidden behind an open wall safe in the background, stage left, from the waist up. Goblin says that merely crushing Spidey like a worm won't be enough. The war crawl has put him through too much, so Goblin's gotta do more. His back to us, putting his mask back on his head in the next panel. Goblin halfway through his monologue says he's gonna toy with Spider-Man and outsmart him every step of the way. But how smart can this man be if he came to this hideout and took his mask off for seemingly no reason at all? He clearly wasn't having trouble speaking because as soon as the mask is back on his face, he continues, saying before he delivers the final stroke, he's going to add insult to all the injury. He'll learn Spidey's identity and then reveal it to the whole world. Then, and only then, I'll finish him forever. A pumpkin bomb in each hand now, he begins packing them into his bag of tricks draped over his shoulder, saying they're more potent than ever. Tasting the victory he knows is coming, he shouts that if he didn't hate Spidey so much, he'd pity him. Suited and booted, his bag of tricks fully stocked, I'm sure both finger guns loaded, he gets to work on his bat-shaped glider that he's still calling a flying broomstick. Cracking the glider open, he begins tinkering inside, bragging to himself that it's faster and more agile than ever. He goes on to say that if he took Spidey seriously from the start, he would have been put the hero on ice. But even so, now Spidey's loss is a foregone conclusion. He hasn't a chance. On three, Goblin's taken to the skies, rocketing away from his secret base. His left fist raised, he's shouting to no one and everyone that by the time his scheme is finished, Spidey will be unmasked and he, the Green Goblin, will have scored the greatest triumph of all. Not a humble bone in his body. We don't want you to think that the average city is crawling with costumed high flyers, but in another section of the teeming metropolis, we find. The city is absolutely beginning to crawl with high flyers, but ironically, the person our narrator is referring to doesn't. We find Spidey suited, yes, booted, of course, both hands gripping a web line swinging high above the city we know and love. He's got a flat brown backpack on his back and, of course, He's shouting as loud as the Green Goblin, giving the game away. Just my luck. I feel as though I'm catching a real heavy head cold. Of course, it could be just an allergy. If we've learned anything about Spidey from his battle with Dr. Octopus way back in Amazing Spider-Man number 12, Unmasked by Dr. Octopus, that's you again here on Me and My Friend Pete. We know Spidey doesn't lose his bravery when he's got the sniffles, but his hands team is the first thing to skip town when he's under the weather. With Green Goblin plotting, what do he say? Ultimate revenge. Ah, right. Ultimate revenge 
I'm thinking this is the absolute worst time to fall ill. Landing horizontally on a sheer wall of a building, he says to be sure he's not the only hero who has to sneeze his way through a fight, he's gonna go pay Dr. Bromwell a visit. Bromwell being, at this point, the family doctor, essentially. And speaking of sneezing, <laughs> seconds later. In the next panel, we see the Goldenrod Kid, Peter Parker, Goldenrod Vest on, white button up beneath, SJB slacks, Widow's Peak, extra peaky, top lip, non-existent. He's exiting a broom closet and is spotted by a maintenance man in an SJB cap, suit, and black tie holding a broom. Shout out to the maintenance men. And of course the man tells Pete that nobody's allowed in the broom closet and asks what the kid's doing in there. Pete replies, Broom closet? I thought it was a waiting room. Walking past the janitor and into the next panel, Pete continues. He says he should have known it wasn't the reception area because there weren't any year old magazines on the table. The janitor, scratching his head, thinks he was here the whole time and didn't see the kid enter at all. Pete, stopping outside of Dr. Bronmo's office, smiling over his shoulder, wonders what the guy would say if he told him that he'd swung in through the window on his web. But I know what the guy would say. Buddy, you're an insane! In the final panel, Pete blowing his nose is stopped from entering the doctor's office by a seated gray-haired nurse who asks if the doctor is expecting him. Pete replies, Well, I don't have an appointment, but I have this bad cold in my nose. The nurse, hearing the sick in our friend's voice, says he's lucky. The doctor has a free moment, and Pete can go on in. On four, Pete gets right to brass tacks. Hi, Doc. I came to see you because I have... Bromwell cuts him off, but before we get into what Bromwell says, I just want to point out that John Romita, the elder, took this time to reimagine Bromwell, making a man much younger than he originally appeared earlier in the series, and if I might add, much hunkier. I'm not even going into a deep physical description. He's quite literally the spitting image of George Clooney in ER, except his hair is gray and he's got a pencil-thin mustache. So he cuts Pete off, probably hypnotizing our hero with his dreamboat eyes, saying that the invisible clothespin Pete's got on his nose is a dead giveaway for a cold, and tells our friend to roll up his sleeve. Pete follows the instructions, thinking, I wonder what he'd say if I had to take my spiny suit off and he saw it peeping out at him from under my shirt. Bromo checks Pete's blood pressure and is shocked to find that Pete's got the pulse of a superhero. Pete, of course, superhero. feigns surprise. Finally. Bromo says Pete's got a whopper of a cold. He's going to prescribe some antihistamine pills and a B12 shot. He goes on to say Pete will be fine in no time, but in the meantime, he wanted to talk about something. Pete rolling down his sleeve replies, You look so grim, Doc. Is anything wrong? Is it about Aunt May? Bromwell, his back to us in the next panel, tells Pete not to be alarmed, that it is about Aunt May, and it is important. As you know, I've been keeping close watch over her since her last operation. Even though she's regained some of her strength, she's an old woman, Pete. He continues into the next panel. And the operation has weakened her a great deal, so I just wanted to warn you, in her present condition, she must have no sudden shocks, no excitement. Any additional setback might very well prove fatal. Drama king that he is, Pete blanches immediately in wide-eyed horror before giving his back to the doctor and lowering his head. Brahma offers a silver lining with a hand on Pete's shoulder. Luckily, you both lead quiet, peaceful lives, which is what your aunt needs more than anything else. I know you'll do all you can to keep her calm and unworried. Pete replies, sure, Doc, sure. But grabbing his backpack, he makes his way towards the door of the office with his head down as the gray-haired nurse envies his age, thinking that he has no troubles, responsibilities, or worries of older folks. She's as wrong as the day is long. I've been so wrapped up in myself lately. I had almost forgotten how near to death Aunt May had been. Now, more than ever, I must see to it that she never learned my secret identity. It would worry me. Into the green. So Pete doesn't want Aunt May to ever find out his identity, and the Green Goblin has made it his singular focus. The tension is mounting, and they aren't even close to squaring up yet. Out in the hallway, Pete presses the down button on the elevator, still lost in thought. I sure don't feel much like classes today, but I can't afford to miss a session. I've had too many absences lately. I've always taken Aunt May for granted, but if anything should happen to her, she's been so good to me all these years. Sacrifice so much for me. He continues these woeful thoughts onto page five. I never thought of it this way before, but she's my only relative. She's all the family I have. Hold on. Yeah. First, Pete's had this exact thought damn near every time Aunt May's struggling or having a rough time because of something he's done. Next, 
He's been having these sad thoughts so long, he's wandered right onto ESU campus without his books and as usual has his hands in pocket walking past the ESU elite. That's the blonde bombshell Gwen Stacy in her usual red dress. That's the king of the Foolsville faithful and football phenom flash fashion on styling on him? Thompson in an olive green suit and simple black shirt beneath it. Go ahead, Thompson. We see you. Fashion's still important here on me and my friend Pete. And a sandy-haired guy in a maroon sweater and green pants. I don't know who he is. Probably won't see him again. Of course, Gwen spots Pete first, and we learn from her that they've all decided to act friendly towards the Forest Hills Prince of Pensivity. That's not a word. Shut it, you! Flash, always down to impress a woman he's courting, puts his best foot forward. With a genuine smile on his face, he waves in Pete's direction. Hi, Pete. How's it going? See anything of Harry Osborne? The sandy-haired who-knows-who scoffs when Pete doesn't reply, saying Flash is just wasting his time. That Peter Parker is the original cold shoulder. Gwen, scowling, says she doesn't understand Pete, that sometimes he's as friendly as a puppy. That's your problem, Gwen, right there. You talking about puppies, you ain't ever took the time to consider a spider's mentality. The kid is going through it. Flash shouts that he knew this was a mistake, that Pete is like nowhere. Called my man the absence of the prospect of progress or success. Pete Parker, you can say it, nowhere man. As the three wonder about Pete's stage right, Harry Osborne pulls up to the curb behind him in a blue convertible, driven by his father, Norman. Harry's in a green tweed suit, SJB vest, and blue bow tie. The waves in his red hair on swim as usual. Norman's wearing a brown suit, black tie, his red hair on tornado. Harry hops out of the car, thanking Norman for the lift. Norman replies with a simple, uh-huh. Harry, staring down at his father on the next panel, probably thinking the man's in the words of my friend Stemma, Judy Attitude. Ask if anything's wrong, adding Norman hasn't said a single word on the drive over from the house to here. And Norman, as he often does when nobody's around to hear him, snaps at Harry. There's nothing wrong. Did you want me to give you a lift or deliver a speech on the way? Harry apologizes for doing absolutely nothing wrong, saying he didn't mean to make Norman angry. But before he can finish, Norman peels off from the curb, shouting at his son as he stares into the rear view. Well, don't wonder. It cost me a fortune to keep you in college, so try thinking about your studies once in a while. Yikes. Harry, doing his best Peter Parker impersonation, shoves his hands into his pocket, thinking everything he says or does displeases his father. He wishes he knew what was wrong. Flash spins around, spots his right-hand man, and can't wait to tell Harry all bets are off when it comes to Pete, that the guy's still hopeless. But now, Harry's ignoring him. Gwen wonders aloud what's wrong with him. Flash replies, Holy smoke! Now he's making with the I don't know you from Adam bit. Translation? He's acting like he's never met us before in his life. Flash says he doesn't know what Parker's got, but they better put the kid in quarantine because it's spreading. In the next panel, we're in the ESU science lab. Professor Warren in the background, stage right, helping random students. Harry sits in the foreground, stage right, jotting his hands in the tidal waves on his head. Stage left, a step behind him, getting sciency with a vial in his hand, a friend Pete, as usual. He takes one look at Harry, thinks, never saw Osborne so quiet. Normally he'd have tossed a dozen insults my way by now. And separates himself from the herd by doing what none of the kids constantly hounding him for being an introvert has ever attempted to do in his case. He talks to Harry. He walks up and asks Harry if anything's wrong. He asks if Harry's feeling well. Harry says he's okay. Then realizing he's talking to the guy who never speaks to him, snaps! And since when is it any of your business whether or not I... Oh, forget it. I didn't mean to snap at you. Penalty on the play. Anger transference. Five-yard penalty. Still first down. Realizing Pete's not the cause of his anguish, Harry shows his softer side and apologizes a moment after. Somebody check outside the window because methinks pigs are flying. Pete senses it too. A slight look of shock on his face. He's thinking... Wow, something must be really bugging him. He's almost acting human. Before Harry unloads his woes to open page six. I just can't figure out parents. Now take my dad. We are always real pals. Till a few years ago. Then he started to change. I know he's been having tough sledding in business. But why take it out on me? Listening intently, Pete realizes that this may be why Harry Osborne is so bitter. Translation? Hurt people hurt people. And Pete gives some decent advice. Putting a hand on Harry's shoulder... He says, I know what you mean, fella, but try to look at it this way. It could always be worse. 
For instance, take me. I don't remember even having a father. Harry is shocked. He says he didn't know Pete was an orphan. But Harry O'Bean, you never ask. Props to Flash too. He knows Pete's an orphan, but never shared that information with his classmates because it wasn't his business to share. Sidebar, here's a little of the me and me and my friend Pete. Most people who truly know me know I'm a private person. Been that way since middle school if I gotta stop and put a finger on it. Mainly because as a poor kid, people tend to use the things about your life that they know as ammo. You use food stamps? Ammo. You get section eight? Ammo. You wearing your sister's hand-me-down clothes? Ain't your sister a big girl? You so slim though. You get the point yet? Ammo. So one day, seventh grade, early in the morning, first period, I was sitting in the back of the class getting ready to draw my Ninja Turtle comics as I was wont to do, or read my Spidey comics as I was wont to do, or stare at the back of my crush's head as I was wont to do. Whatever I was wont to do, I was getting ready to do it until the popular girl in class comes in and asks me a random question. Gerald, she asks. Popular hot chicks talking to me. You know I had time. I says, what's up, girl? Or something similarly as cool. She says, you're a junior? At this point in my life, I wasn't adding junior to the back of my name, so I was a little confused. But I says, yeah, girl, daddy's so nice, they named him twice. How you know? That I really said. Or something close. She says, was your father murdered? Then holds up a newspaper clipping about the man who was still a wanted fugitive for killing my father seven years prior. First, I didn't even take her as a person who read anything except Teen Vogue. That's my prejudice. My bad. Next, I'm lucky I was born with all this righteous melanin because if I wasn't, I'd have been Charmander Red in that moment. What kind of person thinks that's the topic of discussion in a 7th grade classroom? I don't know. Anyways, I got way sidetracked, but just want to say, maybe if you know about the dark things in a person's family history, you might not want to ask them about it surrounded by people you can also assume don't know. So, long story short, giving Flash Thompson a lot of credit here. And to her credit, I began signing Junior after my name in defiance of the moment, and nobody's ever asked me since. Sometimes, you can keep a secret by putting it right on Front Street. That one's free, y'all. Put it in your pockets. Back to Gwen, watching over her shoulder, as she always is in this science lab, is ear hustling as well. She thinks that this moment is great, that if Pete and Harry really are having a heart to heart, Pete might join their gang, and that would be just wonderful for her. In the next panel, Harry apologizes for shouting at Pete, but the prince of punching bags is used to being insulted and tells Harry not to mention it, that sometimes it's good to get things off your chest. Even Flash, sliding his jacket off his shoulders watching the moment unfold, has to give Pete his credit. But not out loud, of course. Oh, of course. Parker's a funny guy. After all the needling he's taken from him, there he is talking to Harry like a Dutch uncle. He's either a real weak sister or a lot more man than we ever thought he was. I'm thinking it's the latter, Thompson. I'm thinking it's the latter. Pete tells Harry not to let the moment bug him too much, that things have a way of getting better when we least expect it. And Harry cheers up, saying he guesses Pete's right. If character was a character, it'd be Pete Parker. But just to prove you're not really reading Tom Brown's school days, class is finally breaking. Action time is approaching fast. Tom Brown's School Days is an 1857 novel written by Thomas Hughes about, you guessed it, a guy named Tom Brown and his adventures at rugby school in the 1830s, rugby school being an English public school. The novel has the distinct honor of being hugely influential to the sport of rugby spread and the genre of British school novels, with the largest influence being on noted transphobe J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series, which, if you're a fan of worlds of make-believe, wonder, exceptionally powered villains, and orphaned children who grow through grit, determination, trials, and tribulations to become something greater than the castaway society would deem them, and I was, and am, to be sure, had a huge impact on your formative years. The novel spawned a host of on-screen adaptations, five to be exact, beginning with a 1916 silent film of the same name, and most recently, a 2005 TV film of the same name. A musical in London's West End in 1971, and a full cast audio drama on BBC Radio 4 in 2001. I had never heard of Tom Brown before this ASM issue, but clearly the guy was, and is, beloved. Stan's reading stories from across the pond, and I'm sure there's some Tom Brown influence in our Amazing Spider-Man. Thanks, Wikipedia. Back to. So class has ended and Pete's heading out of the school building, thinking that he can't shake this cold. That what he needs is some arachnotherapy. You or I might wish for a little web-slinging, and that would be that. But when Peter Parker says it, 
It's for real, Tiger. And Spidey's swinging high above the city in no time, thinking he's feeling better already. The next panel, he's on the scene. The scene? The tallest building in the world in 1966, the Empire State Building. He's web swinging above it, making me wonder what in the world his web line is attached to. A plane, maybe? A hang glider? It's comic books. Let it go and come on. As Spidey defies the laws of physics with his webbing, we see on the ground below, Hoods, Inc. No affiliation with the Burger Gang. They're on the observatory deck of the building, and all of them have guns drawn. A stick em up on the acme of the world. They are different. Spidey knows it too. Wow, look at that. They must be nuts That's to pull a stick up there. Right in Spidey's new territory. Might as well do it in Macy's window. Glad my camera's loaded. Looks like I'll be able to sell some pics to Jolly Jonah. Translation? Donuts and Dimes accounts are about to be flush. In the final panel, we see Hoods Inc. have all decided on a very specific style sense. Suits? SJB blue, tan, green, maroon, olive. Sweaters? Black, orange, black, maroon, green. Fedoras? Tan, yellow, orange, maroon, orange. And every one of them gripping a pistol aimed at three men. A security guard, a man in a brown suit, and another in a lavender suit. Both with matching brown fedoras. And a woman with blonde hair wearing a red dress hugging a small boy with blonde hair and a white long sleeve shirt and green pants. They're all standing in front of the elevator doors. Scandalized. I'm sure there are plenty more people on this roof, but only so many can fit in a square and Johnny Seniors pack them in tight. Green suit looking over his shoulder spots Spidey and points him out. Alice suit says so what? That this is what they were waiting for. And tan suit? About as gangsta as you can get is the only one who hasn't looked over his shoulder for a glimpse at the webhead. Still waving his pistol at the crowd in front of him, he shouts, Let him come, we'll take care of him. Don't nobody try anything funny, Saint. We ain't exactly famous for our sense of humor. Somebody find that clapperboard. On 7, we got action as Spidey dive bombs over the glass partition of the rooftop, head first, huh. and into the crowd of Hood's Inc., fists and feet flying. Of course, SJB shouts that Spidey can't lick them all. Because he's got to say that, even if he doesn't believe it. And the violent game of Twister begins. Left fist cross, right fist straight, right foot back kick, left foot bent. Spidey shouting the whole time. If your flying prowess is as weak as your hospitality, you're in a bad way, Charlie. In the next panel, his legs in yoga pose, warrior one. He throws left elbow out at side and right fist extended uppercut. Sending tan suit flying backwards and green suits jaw north. The last position you want to be in, in a fight. As a third goon rushes towards him from the foreground, the whole time, Spidey's thinking, It's on. They didn't seem surprised to see me. Almost as though they expected me to attack him. Or am I just imagining it? He's not. If you recall, last issue, Norman Osborn paid the leader of Hoods Inc. 20K, or $184,000 in today's money, to get rid of the webhead. Well, he paid them half, like the bills were literally cut in half, but now we're just splitting hairs. And faces. Buzzing. Either way, the word went out on Spidey like Stringer Bell spread it himself and blamed if the hoods of the mid-60s ain't answer the call. That's the tale of the befuddled bruiser, the most comic-y comic book of all. Here on Me and My Friend Pete. Back to Spidey shouts for the gang not to rush because he promises to give them all some quality time. In the next panel, our heroes jumped all the way into his Birkin. Crouched low, he's grabbed the green-suited hood by the face with his right hand and sprawled the tan-suited one with a downward left, his mouth running a mile a minute. It's been quite a while since I just had a nice, simple cops and robbers type of fight with a bunch of average, ordinary, everyday thugs. It makes you realize there's nothing as satisfying as a simple life. And I imagine he's flipped head over feet in a gutter between panels because he's throwing another no-look left. Green suit, draw north, while headlocking an olive-suited thug and on his left tiptoes, tip Toes. Kicks the consciousness out of a third goon in a tan suit and orange sweater. You stalwarts might have a lot of inner qualities, which I'm not aware of, but as conversationalists, you're just a bunch of dropouts. But the numbers are starting to add up. In the gutter between panels, Spidey's grabbed around the waist by an olive suit, grabbed around the right leg by a gray, and grabbed around the shoulders and face by a green. By the time we see him in the next panel, he's got his arms pinned to his side, a hand covering the right side of his face and mouth, and an ear full of smack talk from Hood's Inc. Good work, Boynard. You got him. Bernard, clearly the green-suited thug holding onto our hero, doesn't seem to know the cardinal rule of the Golden Liability Playbook. The cardinal Don't rule. talk crap until you win. Unless you're Spidey. He shouts, 
Yeah, now we won't have to listen to any more of this blasted yapping. Come on, come on, let him have it. We can't hang on to him all day. And he's right, because the very next panel, Spidey shouting they won't be able to hold on to him for another second, Judo flips Olive Suit into Bernard, and then Grey Suit, wishing privately that he had another allergy pill. We turn the page and we're on... The Infinity, Infinity page. page. Page 8. Just in time to witness a long horizontal, where a crowd of onlookers in the presence of the greatest tight-wearing warrior shout their opinions on what they're seeing. It's disgraceful. All those thugs ganging up on one lone man. If only the police would get here. Don't worry about Spider-Man, lady. According to what I read in the Bugle, he's as bad as any of them. Still, he did tackle all those hoodlums single-handed to help us. How do we know he hasn't another, a more sinister reason? As they all comment on the spider in the arena stage right, the King of Swing, the fingers of his left hand pressed against the floor stage left, flips feet overhead, dodging <gasps> a blow from Grey Suit, <sighs> eating a right downward straight to the back of the head by a goon, an olive. His thoughts not breaking for a second. I still have a funny feeling about all this. They're fighting as though they've been practicing for just this moment. As though they've been trained to hold their own against someone like me. If they have, more than a few of them will be clamoring for a refund on the price of that training when this fight is over. Specifically, the goon in the foreground in the green suit, crawling away from the melee on his hands and knees with spots dancing above his head. Whatever Spidey did to this man, he is clearly done with this fray. Shouting that he's beginning to lose his patience in the next panel. Spidey, right hand gripping the collar of the guy who tried to knock him out last panel, throws a left hook that lifts a gray suited hood off his feet and sends him flying into the plexiglass surrounding the rooftop. As the goon crashes into the partition, Spidey shouts, Whammo! One eight ball into the side pocket! The amazing Spider-Man pool sharking above it all. In the next panel, Spidey leaps backwards towards the sheer wall of the roof huh. that Spidey sends tingling as a goon in maroon, crouched low behind a coin-operated binocular, takes aim at our hero, and fires. Doesn't matter. Spidey webs the man into the binoculars in the next panel, forcing the goon to drop his gun as three more hoods, lavender, olive, green, race forward from the background. I imagine one of the goon whispers, more, and suits start pouring out of the elevators, because all this makes me think of the scene in the courtyard of the Matrix Reloaded when the Smiths just keep coming. Spidey is the one, and he's ready for him. He shoots a line of webbing towards the wall across from him, directly in front of the leading goon's feet, shouting that he's much obliged because he's been itching to try out this new tangle-free roll of webbing. Green shouts to watch out for said webbing, but his warning comes too late. Lavender's already tripped and pitched forward head first, taking Olive with him as he does. Nine opens to Spidey in a three on one. I'd say five on one, but one goon's crawling away from him and another's completely knocked out in the background stage right, while in the foreground, the crowd reaction shot gets up close and personal. Blonde mom turns her back to the melee, covering blonde son's eyes, shouting, Those horrible men, why doesn't somebody do something? Don't look at them, Selwyn, you're too young for such an awful sight. Selwyn, trying to fight free of his mother's protective gloved hand, replies, Aw, oh, mom, that fight's team next to the kitty shows on TV. Another hostage, realizing Spidey's giving him an opening, shouts the path to the elevators are clear now, and they can all escape. In the next panel, Spidey thinks, I'm glad my little cheering gallery is leaving before someone gets hurt. No matter how it happened, I'd be sure to get the blame. As the crowd, well, crowds into the elevator, Selwyn is literally kicking and screaming the whole time. Wait, Ma, let me stay. It's just starting to get good. The kid knows action. His mother asked what Soupy Sales would say if she heard him. Paraphrase Milton Suckman, better known as Soupy Sales, was an American comedian, actor, radio television personality, and jazz aficionado whose career spanned 60 years. Given a nickname Soup Bone by his family, his older brothers were nicknamed Ham Bone and Chicken Bone, food clearly being big in his family, probably related Four to Tony Poyo! Chu, Soup Bone shortened it to Soupy and got busy seeking his fortune in the world of entertainment as Soupy Hines before realizing people would probably confuse him with ketchup and James Hines to sales. In 1949, he moved to Cincinnati, Ohio and became a radio DJ. It was in Cincinnati where he started his television career, hosting Soupy Soda Shop, TV's very first teen dance program, and a late night comedy show dubbed Club Nothing. Sales is best known for Lunch with Soupy Sales, also known as 12 O'Clock Comics, and The Soupy Sales Show, probably what Selwyn's mom is referring to here. Lunch with Soupy Sales was a sketch comedy show that began in Detroit in 1953, geared towards children filled with comedy sketches Gags and puns, each with the caveat of ending with a pie in Sales' face. And man, did this guy make his donuts off pies. Quote, 
he developed pie throwing into an art form. Straight to the face, on top of the head, a pie to both ears from behind, moving into a stationary pie, and countless other variations. He claimed that he and his visitors had been hit by more than 20,000 pies during his career. He recounted a time when a young fan mistakenly threw a frozen pie at his neck and he dropped like a pile of bricks. End quote. As time went on and sales popularity grew, it became a badge of honor to receive a pie to the face on a sales program, beginning with the king of crooners himself, Francis Albert Sinatra, but went on to include Tony Curtis, Jerry Lewis, Judy Garland, Frank's Rat Pack mate Sammy Davis Jr., and musical groups The Shangri Las. What up, Queens? The Supremes. What up, Queen? That's Miss Diana Ross. And my personal favorite band of all time, The Temptations. And don't worry, Otis. I came to see you too. As is often the case, the popularity from an entertainer's main show opened doors for said entertainer to branch out into other areas of interest. And in the case of Soupy Sales, the man completely forewent a normal sleep schedule to be everywhere. He hosted a nighttime show, Soups On, in Detroit, which routinely had jazz musicians on as guests and was so popular, the artists who appeared on the show would go on to sell out nightclubs in the Detroit area after appearing on the show. These musicians... Coleman Hawkins, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Billie Holiday, Charlie Parker, Stan Getz, and Clifford Brown, to name a few. A few? They're all Hall of Famers. But sales wasn't done there. So popular was the pie-taking soupy that he was the fill-in host for The Tonight Show between legendary hosts Jack Parr and Johnny Carson. Because of his relationship with Frank Sinatra, who knew throwing pies in a man's face would make you lifelong friends? He was signed to Sinatra's record label, Reprise Records, and recorded two albums, the Soupy Sales Show in 1961, and Up in the Air in 1962. His dance record, The Mouse, peaked at number 76 in the Billboard Hot 100 in May of 1965, and was popular enough that he performed the song in September of 1965 on The Ed Sullivan Show just before the world-famous Beatles. Beatles! From 1968 to 1975, he was a panelist on one of the longest-running game shows of all time, What's My Line? Over a dozen episodes of The Match Game from 66 to 69, countless other guest appearances on game shows from the 60s to late 90s, and was even considered for the role of host on Nickelodeon's Double Dare in the 90s, but wasn't chosen because ageism is real. From 1985 to 1987, he hosted a midday radio show on WNBC in New York City, appeared and starred in film from 1961 to 2005, and television from 1960 to 2001. In 2005, he was given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and I'm sure he'd probably have had more accolades if he ever had time off to receive them. Thanks, Wikipedia. So Selwyn's mom wants to know what Soupy would say if he heard the kid fighting to see this action unfold, but I'm guessing the 20,000 pie man would have said, let the kid live his life. Back to, in the next panel, with a man down between his legs, two rushing him head on, and a third coming at him from stage left, Spidey shoots a web line from both hands towards his overhead beam. As a goon shouts, that blasted webhead must have shot his boat by now. Let's get him. Spidey, stretching the webbing back, shouts, I hate to spoil your pipe dreams, little man, but I intend to be the ginner, not the guinea. Did he just call them crackheads? Jumping off the floor in the gutter between panels, he races towards the goons on his web lines in the next, dropping the two, rushing him headlong with kicks to the face, telling them if they missed the point this time of being crackheads, they should see him after class and he'll review it for him. He lets go of the webbing in the gutter between panels, and flips onto a handstand in the next. Huh. His thoughts going ha. a mile a oh. minute. They don't even act disappointed because they're victims on escape. Now I'm sure there's something not kosher about all this. Although, I guess I should be flattered. They seem a lot more interested in me than in the haul they were trying to make. Holy smoke, what a sap I am. I just remembered something. Spidey has clearly forgotten that there's a price on his head or he doesn't understand how hit contracts work at all. He must be thinking that because he floored all those goonies last issue, he has no worries on that front anymore. Naivete, thy name is Parker. His Spidey sense rattling around in his skull, we see the guy Spidey was standing over two panels ago. Blackjack in hand, cocked back, pistols be damned. But he's gotta be quicker than that, because Spidey throws an elbow to the guy's sternum to open page 10 thinking. Spider sense, I love you. While grabbing a tan suited hood by the collar, Still holding the man by the collar in the next panel, he sends another hood's jaw north with a left cross thrown diagonally as the guy screams. It's no use. We can't outfight him. We've got to use the gimmick. Hurry, get the... Uh. As Spidey wonders what the gimmick is, a guy in a dark brown suit named Blackie, shout out to Blackie Gaxton, no relation, pulls what looks like a red lemon, smoking at its end from who knows where, and shouting that Spidey's strength won't help him now, hurls it towards the webhead. 
The gimmick hits Spidey square on the chest in the next panel, and he erupts into a white cloud of gas as Blackie shouts, You did it! We got him now! Here, smart guy, we have this all ready and waiting, just for you. So just stand there and take a nice deep breath in. Make believe like it's Poifume. Man, it's called it Poifume. Spidey wonders what he's blundered into, but the gas doesn't seem to hurt him at all. And, high above the scene of battle, a sinisterly smirking spectator slightly spies upon the startled Spider-Man. Stan, alliteration on best ever Lee is working right now. High above the spire of the Empire State Building, so is the Green Goblin. As Spidey, surrounded by goons, fights through the gas on the rooftop below, Goblin watches with binoculars, a cloud of white smoke billowing from the glider beneath his feet. And of course he's screaming, giving the game away. Everything went perfectly according to plan. My trumped up robbery attracted him, as I knew it would. And the gas? He is just in hell where we can all his senses, including his most potent weapon, his spider sense. Then, with his spider sense not functioning, I'll be able to humble him at will. So this gas the goblins created has just shut down Spidey's spider sense, and Spider-Man has no idea. What does this mean for the King of Swing? On 11, green suit, sandy hair, shouts according to the Green Goblin, the gas was supposed to polish Spidey off. Maroon suit, sandy hair, shouts the Green Goblin tricked them. Gray suit, pop collar, inky black hair, has heard enough. Well, I'm cutting out. I'm not tackling him again. And Spidey? His four-page lesson in Berber gang bruising is coming to an end. He shouts it's time for Hoods Inc. to take their examination as the three remaining Hoods, still standing, turn and run. The professor of pugilism. The tussling teacher. The irradiated educator. The amazing Spider-Man. I don't know what Spidey did to Grey Suit in the gutter between panels, but the man's already down for the count in the next as Spidey, back to us, clubs Green Suit in the back of the skull while grabbing Maroon around the collar. I don't know what that gas was supposed to do, but I hope you bought it with a money back guarantee. With a final left cross that sends Green Suit's jaw north, this fight is over. As the gang lick their wounds on hands and knees, Spidey snaps a photo of them thinking that these pics are going to have JJ cutting a check for the Parker Donuts and Dimes account. Of course, Officers Mike, Bowtie Charlie, and Billy Blackman rush out of the elevator and onto the rooftop in the next panel. Better late than never, I guess. Guns drawn, demanding Spidey tell them what's happened here. Spidey, leaping and oh. taking a seat on the horizontal pole above his head, shouts, Those capricious little cut-ups on the floor in front of you know more about it than I do. Personally, I was just passing by before leaping from the pole. Huh. Bowtie Charlie shouts that Spidey can't just flee the scene this way. But Blackman cuts him off saying there's no way they can stop the King of Swing. But the heroes left a consolation prize in the form of Hood's Inc. In the final panel, Spidey web swings away thinking, <laughs> Well, not a bad hour's work. I stopped the robbery, got some exercise, and took some pictures I should be able to sell. But I'd still like to know who hired those bozos and why they were so prepared for me. He's been fighting for an hour. Endurance on best ever. Uh, Cap can do it all day. Shut it, you. Toe opens to Spidey, a web line attached to the bottom of each foot, descending into an alleyway, grabbing a sack made from webbing from the sheer wall of a building, as he does. His battling done, he's finally giving thought to the seemingly ineffectual gimmick bomb that was tossed at him. Most of all, that business with the gas really sinks me. Why didn't it do whatever it was supposed to do? Or did it without me knowing it? Oh well, I better take my clothes from where I left them and head for home. He reaches the ground and pulling the mask from his face, begins changing. Thanks to my spider sense, I don't have to worry about these quick change sessions. If anyone was watching me, I'd be aware of it. But no one's out to see me here, in the shadows of this old deserted building. Wonder if I'd get kicked out of the superhero union for not using a phone booth. Spidey thinks his spider sense is going to protect him, but we know that ain't happening. But, even as the weary though contented youth silently transforms himself into Peter Parker again, a pair of merciless malevolent eyes observe his every move. And no lies spoken in the caption box. Above Spider Pete, hovering on his glider, which of course now has a silent mode, watching our hero change, is the Green Goblin, thinking that he's going to be the first to learn our hero's secret identity. Watching Pete get changed, he's shocked to find that the King of Swing can't be more than 19 or 20 years old which I'm sure doesn't do wonders for the Green Goblin's ego. On the ground below, we learn that Spidey puts his socks and shoes on first before even putting his pants on. If you've ever put your pants on after your sneakers or shoes, you know the trial and how difficult that can be, making me wonder if this is something people used to do in the mid-1900s. If you know, let me know in the comments. Weird order of clothing operations aside, Pete's thinking he's got to get home so Aunt May doesn't worry, especially after what Dr. Bromwell told him about May's health. 
He gets his pants on, shirt too, and tucking it into his waistband, thinks he heard something, a rustling above, like the whooshing of a bird. But instead of looking up to check like most people without a spider sense would do, he thinks, but why didn't my spider sense tingle? It should have reacted long before my ears picked up the sound. So now, I'm assuming that Pete doesn't even check his surroundings anymore. That's why he's always walking around with his hands in his pockets and his head down. He's probably thinking if there were any issues, his spider sense would alert him to it. And we've seen this theory in action. Last issue, just a guy named Joe. Pete damn near took a brick to the head walking with his head down, oblivious to the superpowered menace wreaking havoc in the neighborhood around him. That's the tale of the befuddled bruiser, the most comic-y comic book of all. Here are me and my friend Pete. Your honor, I rest my case. In the final panel, Pete throws his goldenrod vest on, rushing towards the mouth of the alley, oblivious to the green goblin hovering above his right shoulder. Come on, Parker, get a grip on yourself. You're so used to being in trouble that when you're not, you start imagining things. The next thing I know, I'll start seeing goofy costume supervillains who aren't there. What's that old saying? It ain't paranoia if they're really out to get you. Lucky page 13 opens unluckily for our hero as the goblin stalking him thinks he's going to follow Spidey home. But there's a bright note. Pete seems to have shaken his cold. Not his worried thoughts, though. Now, he's thinking that he can't help but think about his spider sense. That something deep inside his brain is trying to deliver a message he's just not getting. He's jittery and doesn't know why. His thoughts drift back to a moment in Amazing Spider-Man number 37. Once upon a time, there was a robot. Specifically when he, as Spider-Man, pushed Mendel Strom out of the way of a rifle aimed at the man, saving his life. Of course, Strom died from a heart attack seconds later, but that can't be put on Spidey. Maybe. Pete's thinking back to spotting the tip of a rifle through an open window of Strom's lab. He pushes Strom out of the way, shouting, Look out! Then leaps onto the sheer wall of Strom's laboratory, huh. racing towards the window. But reaching the window, a feat that took a literal two seconds, agility on best ever, the rifle and whoever was holding it, both gone. That's swinging and clanging and banging here on me and my friend Pete. Back to. We're back in the present now, Pete in profile in the foreground, the shadow of the Green Goblin above him on the building in the background. Romita is working. Pete finishes his internal monologue. That was when I first began to doubt my spider sense. Had there really been someone at the window? If so, how did he escape so quickly? Or was my spider sense beginning to fail me? I wonder if I'll ever know. In the final panel, we're on the scene. The scene? 39th Street, 2nd Avenue, Midtown, Limestone Building. You can't miss it. Sight of the Daily Bugle. We're above the shoulder of the Green Goblin hovering in the foreground as Pete, scratching his head on the street below, enters the building. And Goblin, patient man that he is, thinks, What's this? He's not going home? He's entering the Daily Bugle building? Well, no matter. I can afford to wait. And I gotta give Goblin credit. A lot of villains in his situation right now would probably snatch the feet out of the jaws of victory by jumping the gun. But Goblin's been plotting this revenge for months, months he said. What's a few more moments between sworn enemies? On 14, we follow Pete as he enters the Daily Bugle's bullpen and spots Jameson's demon reporter, Ned Leeds. His sandy blonde hair perfectly combed back in a maroon suit I'm with a black and green pinstripe tie. On. He's on the phone telling whoever's on the other line to let him know if they hear anything about an unnamed her. I'm sure he's talking about Betty Brandt. Pete, thinking he doesn't want to spar with Leeds right now, tries to head toward Jameson's office, thinking if he's lucky, Ned won't spot him. But Pete doesn't have good luck. Only great skill. So a moment later... Hello there, Parker. I didn't know you were here. I was just trying to get some info on Betty's whereabouts, but no luck yet. I want to tell you something, fella. Pete, a scowl creeping down his forehead and onto his brow, thinks... That's what he's saying! He wouldn't want to know if he could help it. And what did Ned want to tell him? I'm sorry I snapped at you the other day. It's just that I was upset about Betty's disappearance. I had no call to fly off the handle at you. The Peter Parker redemption tour continues. Now, Ned Leeds is trying to make peace. Pete thinks that next, J. Jonah Jameson will be blowing him kisses, but says, Forget it. I guess the whole thing was as much my fault as yours. I hope you do find her, Ned. And when you do, you don't have to worry about me. As of now, Peter Parker is out of the race. You're on your own. Ned thanks Pete for letting him know where he stands in the two-part ways. Pete, head down, hands in pocket, as usual, thinks he should open up a Lonely Hearts agency, that he doesn't know what made him be a bigger man in that situation, but he's glad he did. That now, he may just be able to put Betty Brant out of his mind forever. Speaking of why Pete did the right thing when talking to Ned, I'm a firm believer in kindness being contagious. Brawl on the top of the Empire State Building notwithstanding, Pete had a really human moment earlier in the day with Harry Osborne, and something of that moment of kindness may have bled over into this one. 
Pete's catching wins left and right with people he wasn't vibing with. But the feel-good moment doesn't last long, as a voice screams from off-panel. Parker, is that you? I want to see you! Pete turns his head and is staring at the miserable magnate himself, J. Jonah Jameson, in green slacks, a white shirt, black tie, cigar, in mouth, as usual. This J.J. tirade? Is Central Park larger than Monaco? Wait, Of what? course he tirades! How many times do I have to tell you this is a newspaper office, not a campus hangout? If you haven't any photos for me, get lost! But Pete's ready for him. He replies, Funny you should mention that, JJ. I just happen to have an exclusive series of pics showing Spider-Man with a gang of hold-up hoods he captured. And I promise we can practically see the swindle creeping into JJ's eyes in the next panel. He says the guy's on top of the observatory? Why didn't Pete say so? Pete says the man didn't ask. He hands the photos over to JJ in the final panel, who takes them with the usual backhanded compliments and questions. Hmm, not bad. Not good, maybe, but not bad. How'd you happen to be on the scene to get these shots? Pete tells the man that if he asks him no questions, he'll tell him no lies. Translation? None of your beeswax. JJ, already owing our friend three checks at my last count, tries to make it a fourth, telling Pete that he's going to send the kid a check in the mail next week. Pete, understandably over getting ripped off, puts his foot down. He says when JJ pays, JJ will play. He's going to keep the pictures until then. On 15, JJ snaps again. Turning his back to Pete, he's on another tirade. No punk kid holds up J. Jonah Jameson. You can have your crummy photos. But Pete's unbothered. He says he's going to take the pics over to the Daily Bugle's competition, the Daily Globe, because they pay more anyway. This is a bluff, of course. The Daily Globe may pay more, but the editor-in-chief there asks way more questions than J.J. J.J. doesn't give a crap how Pete gets the photos, as long as he keeps bringing in photos. But the editor over at the Daily Globe, he was pressing Peter harder than a high school senior on prom night for info on how Pete comes up with his shots of Spidey in action. So I'm sure Pete doesn't want to go through that again. But you'd be amazed what people will put up with for their donuts and dimes accounts. And J.J. knows it. He says the Globe would never buy Pete's picks, calling our friends bluff. But he immediately folds in the next panel, pulling a check from who knows where and holding it up to Pete. This man has been saying for three issues that he can't get any money out because Pete broke up with Betty Brant and she disappeared. But he has checks just sitting in his pocket ready to go? Miserable. I bet this is just one of the checks he owes Pete. Pete tells JJ he's all hard, but JJ refuses to accept a compliment in this moment. Sure, sure, I'm all tanked up with the milk of human kindness. But as for you, his anger bleeds into the next panel. You call yourself a photographer? Horse thief is more like it. You robbed me. Everybody robbed me because I'm so easygoing. The Nile, baby, is more than a river in Egypt. It is flowing through the Daily Bugle bullpen right now. But Pete's not paying the man any mind. His smile so big it forces his eyes closed. He's holding the check up thinking, You only paid half of the pictures are worth. But I should worry. This money's gonna look mighty good to Aunt May. And that's all I care about. But if you forgot about the goblin, he's still on the scene, clutching a small parabolic microphone. That's a microphone mounted inside of a satellite-shaped dish to more easily pull in sounds. And Goblin's technical and engineering prowess can't be understated. His shotgun mic, as he calls it, is a lot smaller than actual shotgun mics are today, and he's used it to listen through the sheer limestone walls of the building. Gotta give the Goblin credit. His bag of tricks is filled with some top-notch doodads. Pete may be happy about his payday, but the one thing the Goblin didn't know is now no secret. Thanks to my little shotgun, Mike. I heard him call himself Peter Parker. So now I know his name. Alas, poor Spider-Man. His precious identity is a secret no longer. Alas, poor Spider-Man, he says, as if Spidey is Jorick the court jester from the Bard's play Hamlet. This ain't good, because if you don't know, spoiler alert, Jorick is but a skull in the hand of Hamlet, dead on arrival. This is not a good comparison in this moment. And on the ground... Pete is still getting the feeling that something just ain't right. I imagine he's taking the subway home in the gutter between panels because when we next see him, he's still hands in pocket outside of his Forest Hills home, thinking, Uh-huh, all I probably need is a good night's sleep. I'm probably just overtired from all my studying and web swinging. But I can't wait to see Aunt May's face when I give her this check. I just wish it could still be more. Funny, I still feel someone else is nearby. And then... Breaking the heavy silence with the shrill impact of a fingernail grating along a blackboard, the raucous, cackling voice of the Green Goblin cuts through the night air. Pete freezes, shouting he'd recognize that voice anywhere. The Green Goblin! You... you found me! 
The goblet rockets into the final panel, hovering just above the awning of Pete's home, both hands raised in triumph, and he's shouting. Correct, Parker! Your web-slinging masquerade is finally finished! And so are you, Spider-Man! Cut off from his front door by the goblin to open page 16, Pete's not talking, he's thinking. I've got to defeat him. Somehow. I can't let him escape the secret of my identity. And if the goblin ain't chomping at the bit. I've waited so long for this moment, but it was worth it. It was worth everything. Before Pete can make a move, another thought crosses his mind. But I just remember, it's more than my problem, aren't me. Doc Bromwell said any sudden shock could be fatal to her. What if she learns about this? If Aunt May finds out Pete's Spider-Man in a moment like this, it'll damn near, if not fully, kill her. Tortured by an unrelenting concern for his beloved aunt's welfare, the desperate youth suddenly makes a lightning fast move, only to find. And we've got action. Pete goes to play two of the Golden Liability playbook. Play two? If fists don't work, there's always the shooters, and raises his right hand ready to let fly from his wrist. But no! I forgot! I'm not wearing my costume! My web shooter's in my belt! Pete literally only has one item in his bag of tricks, and they can do him no good right now! The perpetually grinning goblin shouts that Pete looks disappointed, and he's right! For one of the very few times, Pete is frozen stock still. He doesn't know what to do. He knows the goblin won't give him time to change, and he doesn't want Aunt May seeing him battling the green goblin. His hands, as they say, are tied. So torn by worry and doubt is Peter Parker that his normally lightning-swift reflexes fail to come to his aid before the goblin can launch his cunning attack. Goblin shoots around the lawn in the gutter between panels, filling the area with thick, noxious black smoke from his goblin glider, causing Pete to fall back onto a nearby tree, clutching his throat. And if Goblin ain't talking, his smack. The great Spider-Man! Nothing more than a cattle youth, a pathetic stripling! It is almost an insult to my own great powers for me to battle one as outclassed as you are. But how you shall now pay to make up for the many times you've escaped me in the past. And even as the two arch foes face each other, possibly for the last time within the house, we find. 17 opens and we find Queen May herself in the den of the Parker home sitting in a high back chair, wearing a full length green dress, doing some knitting. Probably a thick sweater for her delicate nephew Peter Parker, wondering what the strange sounds are outside. As the sounds grow louder, she decides to go out and have a look through the window. But Pete's unlucky situation turns out to be May's saving grace because the goblin smokescreen attack has filled the lawn outside of the Parker home with thick black smoke. May can't see a thing. Placing her hand to her chin in the next panel, she worries about a one Peter Parker. Poor Peter, out there alone on such a dark, fog-shrouded evening. I do wish he were home. He's a frail young man, and the city can be so cold, so merciless. If you only knew, May. But at that very second, May Parker's frail young man prepares to give a good account of himself against the deadly green goblin. Pete, his goldenrod vest open, probably flapping in the wind, the top button of his white button up pop to reveal the red and web blaze Spidey costume beneath it. Spider Pete, on the scene, has finally gotten over his moment of frozen inaction and gets spidery. Back flipping huh. above the smoke and up onto the tree he stumbled into earlier and landing upside down with his feet on a branch and his right hand pressed against the trunk. Safe for a moment, he wonders how he can wage an assault on a green goblin without Aunt May hearing him as the goblin circles around for another pass. A moment later, spider Pete's forced to leap away from the tree and huh. into a one-armed oh. handstand as Goblin fires a laser beam from his right pointer <laughs> finger aimed at our hero, still shouting. Ah, you're fast, Parker, even faster than I remember. But I don't mind it if you drag our battle out a bit. It can only make the sweet sin of victory that much more palatable for me at the end. How is May not hearing this? The impact of the blast still forces Spider Pete to his knees, and that's where we find him to open page 18, staring up at the Green Goblin, who's just reached into his bag and pulled a small purple bat-shaped device he's calling, you guessed it, a bat missile. Calling our hero and pal hapless, he shouts that the missile is going to end the young Dugger's petty cares and woes forever. Spider Pete, in about as precarious a situation as you can get, thinks, His missile's jet propelled. My timing has to be perfect. Now! Pushes off the ground with his left hand, huh. and both knees bent in front of him, throws his right arm wide above his head, ha. barely dodging the bat missile. How bear is bear? As it flies past his chest, it rips open his white shirt further, so now we can see the spider logo of Spider-Pete's costume beneath it. 
The goblin says that fighting our hero as he is right now, he forgot about the kid's dazzling speed, but promises it's only a temporary respite. But while he's talking, Spidey's thinking. He's not even close again. Now's my chance. I've got to get him now. I've got to, for the sake of Aunt May. And we get Johnny Romita's very first panel of the week. Here on me and my friend Pete, as Spider Pete, gumption on best ever thinks, every second longer that we fight out here, brings her a minute closer to discovering my secret. Then leaps above the smoke on the ground, both huh. arms raised, his fingers curled, itching for a piece of the goblin, shouting, all right, Goblin, you've had your fun, and now it's time for me to get in a few licks. Now Batten, the princely king with arachnid genes, hailing from Forest Hills, Queens. Number one, spider Peep. And giving Goblin credit, he gives our hero credit. His right fist clenched, left arm bent back, bracing for impact. He shouts, Spoken with the true spirit of daring do, you bumbling young incompetent. A pity that your words shall prove as useless as your overrated powers. Translation? I don't believe you, you need more people. And to prove it, he puts a finger to the chest of the leaping spider Pete to open 19 and zaps the shot rock, spit out of our hero. As Pete falls back towards the ground, Goblin goes into his bag of tricks and pulls out a small ghost shaped device that looks like a handkerchief and hurls that towards Pete, shouting. Now that I've staggered you, it's time for my newest Goblin surprise. Here's a present, little man. Try to catch it if you can. Bar. Pete, still blinded from the goblin sparks he was struck with last panel, has no way to defend himself. And then, before the amazing adventurer can regain his vision, the little ghost connects with Pete's chest and he erupts into a flood of white smoke, filling the next panel as the goblin tells us what we're looking at. Even your much vaunted spire power can't resist an asphyxiation grenade. It was with just such a trinket that I once stopped the human torch himself cold in his tracks. For who can continue to fight when the oxygen is prevented from reaching his lungs? And my people, you know I looked it up. I could find no fight between Green Goblin and Johnny the Human Torch at this time. If anybody knows when he and Johnny went toe to toe, let me know because I gotta see how the Torch took this W. Back to Pete. Nearly suffocated, falls to the floor. Stunned but still conscious, his outer garments frayed and tattered, revealing his spidey costume more and more. Before he can fight back to his feet, Goblin is on him with a steel alloy rope he pulled from who knows where. I'm starting to think Hermione Granger enchanted Gobby's bag of tricks to be a bottomless pit. So it is, when Peter Parker has fully recovered his senses, he finds. Pete, his spider costume poking out of his wrists and ankles, is bound by the steel alloyed cables around his arms and torso and being dragged through the air above his Forest Hills home by the Green Goblin, who has a fist raised in triumph again. I've defeated you at last! The Green Goblin has won! The only battle that counts! The final battle! In the gutter between panels, they rocket out of Queens, and when next we see them in the final panel, they're above the waterfront near the East River, because it's always the East River flying high over the warehouses here. Pete wonders why the goblin will be bringing him to his hideout, and that's a good thing to wonder. He could have put the kid on ice on his own front lawn. Talk about insults to injury, but if there's one thing we know about the goblin, there's a method to his madness. Maybe. Exactly 40 seconds later. We're inside the goblin's lair to open page 20, as he works with the chemistry set stage left. He's holding up an Erlenmeyer flask while on the table behind him, retort flask, graduated cylinders, and Friedrich's condensers sit on a lab desk, a thin wisp of smoke wafting from the sink beside them. Pete, tied to a metal chair with rivets running along the outer edges of the thing, struggles quietly against the ropes binding him. I might be able to break these steel alloy bonds if I have enough time, but how much time will he give me? And of course, Goblin, as silver age as they come, is going to give Spidey all the time in the world. You're probably wondering what fate I have in store for you. Well, rest assured, it will be one you deserve. Stalling for time in the next panel, Pete, now fearless without worry of Aunt May finding him in this position, gets lion-hearted. You might as well finish me off right now, because if you delay, I'll end up beating you, as I did in the past. That's a fact. You know how gangster you gotta be to be tied to a chair and telling your captor that you're still gonna beat them? I mean, you remember that scene where James Bond is sitting tied up naked to a chair in Casino Royale? You ain't telling me he ain't get that bravery from the King of Swing. 007, reading ASM number 39. Back to Goblin, hearing Pete telling him that he's never got a clean W over the Spider-Man. Snap! 
You never beat me. Those are just accidents. Do you hear? Accidents. You can't rush me now. You'll never escape. Jabbing a finger in Pete's face, he goes on to say that he's got one final surprise for the webhead. Pete's not talking. He's thinking. That's it. Keep talking, bragging, ranting, anything. Just so long as I have a little while longer to strain against these coils. And while he struggles against the ties that bind, the Green Goblin reaches up, grabbing the mask covering his own face, shouting, Since you'll never live to betray me to another soul, it's only fitting that you learn the identity of the one who has beaten you. And so, at long last, the Green Goblin will introduce himself. This guy is a nut. Insane. Insane or not, he pulls the mask from his wavy red-haired head in the final panel, still shouting, Take a look, Parker. A good long look. It's the last face Spider-Man will ever see. It's the real face of the Green Goblin. The face of Norman Osborn. Pete, his jaw damn near to the floor, stares at Norman Osborn in wide-eyed shock and screams himself. Those features. That name. Of course. You're related to my own classmate. You're Harry Osborn's father. And fittingly, a screen caption box closes this issue. Next issue, Spidey saves the day. And we're out! First, pacing. The way Stan told this story, I was really feeling the tension mount as the stakes kept increasing before the real showdown began. Spidey had a cold, loses spider sense, doesn't realize it, loses secret identity, doesn't realize it, is ambushed in front of his home, and the moments with Harry Osborn and Ned Leeds really went a long way to cooling that mounting tension, even having me forgetting it for whole pages before I remembered Pete was about to be in the fight of his life. But comics are a visual art form, and none of this great story would have been nearly as legendary as it's become if not for Johnny Romita. He knew he had some big shoes to fill, and if he didn't handle it with all types of a plum. You know art is legendary when 30 years after the release of this comic, we saw an homage paid to it in Spider-Man the Animated Series in the season three episode, Turning Point, where Norman snatches Pete up at a dinner party, destroying our friend's black tux, much like Pete's outfit was destroyed here. But here, the art from the page one splash to the final scene was polished and clean as if Romita has been doing this Spidey thing for years. The panel of the week was my favorite, but it could have been any of the many in this one. Norman Osborn revealing he's the Green Goblin. Pete trying to web shoot, forgetting he's not wearing his weapons. Pete dodging from Gobby's finger blast. Not how you think. The GD battle on top of the Empire State Building, which at that time was the literal top of the world. Ah, it's enough to make me swoon. And next episode? I mean, do I have to say you don't want to miss it with Pete strapped to a chair and the Goblin lording over him? Join us for ASM number 40, Spidey Saves the Day, featuring the end of the Green Goblin. That's the main episode this week. And that's true. That's the main episode. But there is more me and my friend Pete available for your listening pleasure right now. If you sign up to patreon.com slash HSPP in the Key Keeper or High Council tiers, patrons have a vault filled with bonus episodes covering comic book stories from all over the multiverse of comic book universes. Next bonus episode, we're heading back to the future like, well, back to the future running through a tale of DC's greatest superhero team of tomorrow, the Legion of Superheroes. Question, what happens when there's a traitor in your mist and your mist is literally Legion large? We're about to find out. I can promise at least one explosion and enough action to keep even the Legion of Superheroes busy. Sign up now so you don't miss Legion of Superheroes volume five, number 10. If you become a patron before ASM number 50, you receive a special thank you lapel pin for being a patron during season two. Let's keep these good times rolling. You won't regret it. You got questions? Send them to me in my friend Pete at gmail.com and I'll go digging for the answers. Follow us on Instagram at MNMFP underscore podcast. The panel of the week can be found at patreon.com slash HSPP. No charge. I didn't draw it. All that said, that's all that said. That Dusty chose a calling, so there's no use stalling, but a quick shameless plug for the people. Please like, please comment, please, please share, Google please podcast, take care, you? and please think of the world and be true to yourself. And remember, with great power, baby, you gotta make sure you're being responsible. I'm out of here.